John, it's fantastic to meet Pleasure you. Pleasure to meet you too, Thank John. Thank you yeah. very much for coming to, to talk with us. Um, could you please tell me a little bit about your, your background, your professional background? Yeah, I'm a recently retired um, Metropolitan Police Detective. I served for 25 years. Um, most of my work I specialised in child abuse investigations and vice and I, I left, I retired um, on a nil health pension um, back in October of 2017 but just prior to that I'd been in a uh, three year dispute with the Metropolitan Police in order to get my uh, pension and it all stemmed from my role as a whistleblower and in 2004, whilst on the Met Specialist Vice Unit, I was investigating child prostitution. I was one of a very small group, and an allegation had been made by a young girl, a young 13, 14 year old girl, that she was being pimped out. Um, she was in a care home. She'd, she'd made allegations in the past and been looked at, and uh, I took taken on that allegation. And what had happened is that this girl um, wasn't alone. She told me about other girls, who told me about other girls. And then in the end, we, we uncovered a big child prostitution racket that was occurring in London. So, so you described yourself as a whistleblower, which yeah. I understand as um, being somebody who speaks against um, corruption within their own organisation. So in what sense were you blowing the whistle on your own organisation? What had happened is that I drafted a report on the sheer extent of child prostitution in London and the fact that it had been going on uh, unabated for well over 15 years and in doing so I was brought to the attention of um, the senior commanding officer for the unit who instead of um, treating me with favour he threatened me and he threatened me by saying that what I'd exposed would um, say destroy but the word was F the police past present and future and if I ever mentioned a word of what I'd exposed I would lose my home my job and my children now just just playing devil's advocate yeah sure. um, is there a sense in which he would be concerned that if this information came to light there would be unreasonable pressure on the police to have done things that was not reasonably within their scope to be capable of doing. You know, that, that, that is a good question. And that was asked by um, a solicitor very recently. The, the government have got the what they call the ICSA panel, which is the uh, independent child sexual abuse thing uh, running at the moment. And I've been asked to sit on it. And, and uh, the solicitor for the, the government panel asked me the very same question. You know, you may well have embarrassed them into failings. And my reply to him was this: I said, "Your your work as a solicitor is not too dissimilar to that of a detective when it comes to sort of preparing stuff for court." I said, "If you found that there was a failing within your company and you were losing cases unnecessarily, and you brought them to the attention of your senior partner," I said, "Certain things might happen. If there has been a failing." then okay, they might be slightly professionally embarrassed, but tomorrow is day one and you can go on to win more cases and therefore be more successful. Um, and probably what will happen is that you'll be praised for your diligence. But if your senior partner then threatened you, sacked you, um, tried to imprison you, and then said he was gonna get your children removed, do you not think that that would be a very nefarious and absolutely over the top thing to do? And he went, well, of course it would. I said, yes, well, yeah. That was a situation. And what was said to me, see, this was on the backdrop of a, a very old school and wily detective I'd worked with a few years previously. And we'd been on investigations into um, paedophilia. And he turned around to me and said, you know, John, the one thing I've got to say to you, you're getting very good at what you do. And we was tracking down transient paedophiles. He said, in any- Sorry, a transient paedophile, is that yeah. someone who commits a crime in an area, then as he becomes known, he moves to another moves area? Away. Yeah. yeah, what happened is the Sex Offenders Registry Act had come out in 1997, and people had to sign on as a paedophile in the area where they were residing. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of paranoia, a lot of them didn't want to be shown out as a paedophile. So they were moving about, and there was a problem with transient paedophiles. And he turned around to me and said, you know, because um, I was tasked with um, locating paedophiles that had gone to live on the inland canals um, waterways network. And there was two to know. 
and they said if you find another two in the next few months we'll be very happy well i found 90. you found 90, 90. and you're expected to find two at best yeah how did you how did you go about finding these people well i, I it's boots on the ground really and it comes down to just old school coppering, you know, just being very good at your job and uh, using a bit of intelligence. But they well, I mean, it's, it's such a delicate issue. How do you broach it? I mean, do you do you talk to, to young people? Do you talk to parents? Well, you, you, you need informants. You need to deal with the community themselves. Um, that people would come forward, and then you just use your copper's nose. There'll be a lot of people would set up these little boats and do charity events and um, outreach work with special needs kids. And then you'd have to check their background and found out that there was a, a huge percentage of them were paedophiles mm -hmm. and they were taking kids in uh, for respite care on these boats wow. and so it's a big problem but um but it was just massive but what what this fellow said to me in any level of um policing that if you do well you're praised and you're promoted when you're dealing with paedophilia you've got to be careful because they'll shut you down and why is that well, he used an example of a politician mm. who at the time was a Home Secretary. Uh, I shan't name him only because yeah, of uh, contemptuous matters, but um, he said, we had this man twice banged to rights and on each occasion we were shut down. And what was said to me by a victim and survivor of abuse is that um, paedophilia has and always will control global politics. So that's uh, that's a huge issue. jump. Okay, I'm I'm quite quite open-minded, generally yeah. speaking. But how do we make that enormous jump? Well, the thing is that um, I, like yourself, was very naive to this world, and I was warned to just be very careful. And within two weeks of him making it, that declaration to me, I was moved, and I just couldn't work it out. It just it just seemed a bit bizarre to me, and I had no idea really of conspiracies or anything like that. Now. What they do is they brand this, this term about conspiracy theorists, but conspiracy is a statute law. You can conspire yes. with anyone other than your wife mm -hmm. to commit any numerous crime. You know? So it's always been the case, uh, but it's a way that they denigrate people yes. that, that get too close to the truth. But all of a sudden, I was then threat well warned about this is the problem when you get too big with paedophilia. And then not many months down the line, I'm now in a situation where I'm being threatened for exposing the same crime again to I mean, uh, an occurring thing. Logically, any form of paedophilia must involve conspiracy because it's something that happens in secret. Yeah. Other people know it goes on. And so people conspiring behind closed doors to protect one another's interests is necessarily a conspiracy. So I don't have any problem with that, with that concept. But with what you were saying about paedophilia um, having such an influence on global politics, yeah. How do we make that connection? Well, now I, I work with um, a lovely guy called Bill Maloney, who's um, a victim and survivor of abuse, and, and he's probably the prom most prominent anti-child abuse activist in the country, and has, uh, and has had that accolade for many years. And he brought on board uh, a fellow that had been a local councillor and senior social worker for many, many years. And he started telling me about the abuse that went on in the care homes and his attempt to expose it and again mm. he felt that come across the same stone walls as I did and I turned around to him and I said if all this documentation is in existence which clearly proves nefarious activities of politicians and of, of councillors and businessmen why do they keep it and he said it's, it's well, for one reason it has massive blackmail value right. and he said the National Archives is where they keep a lot of this and um, and he gave me a couple of examples, which again, I've got to be careful if I mention. Mm. It, but, and this is one of the things. Now, when I was threatened into silence, I was in a state of shock and I just couldn't believe it. But unbeknownst to me, I was not alone. And what they do is when they silence you, firstly, they do threaten you uh, and they put the fear of God into you. Um, but they then isolate you. Um, it was only a couple of years later when I actually came forward and made a criminal allegation against the Metropolitan Police as a whole for corruption um, that I was then introduced um, to other people, detectives around the country, who in turn had exposed um, child prostitution mm. and had been bullied in an identical manner as myself. If I'm not jumping too far here, John, could you please tell me, is there a sense in which 
Highly placed politicians who want political control have therefore been using the Metropolitan Police to find dirt on people that they subsequently control politically because of what they know about them. Well, it will be feasible and also you've got to ask yourself, why on earth would the police ever want to cover this up? Yes. You know, the most vulnerable and intimidated members of our society are being hurt mm. by the most abhorrent and vilest crimes you can imagine, mm. and yet they're covering it up and have done. They, they've never had it properly policed, mm. if at all. And when I was threatened with the loss of, of you know, my home, my job, my children, but the other thing that was said to me, you have no idea who or what you are dealing with. You need to back away. Uh, and this is it. And another whistleblower, a, a copper that exposed uh, a big cover-up involving not just um, child rape, but child murder in a children's home called Haute de la Garenne in Jersey, turned around to me and said, the tentacles of this will go right to the heart of the British establishment. Be very careful. John, do you think there's a sense in which there is ever deliberate entrapment? in order to gain political control. So what I mean by that, for example, is let's, let's imagine that I um, am a senior um, person either within a political party or that pulls the strings from outside the formal structure of the party. Um, and let's say I am tasked a bit like a lobbyist with getting through legislation. So I want to control the way people within my party vote. I want them to cooperate. And we know that people have certain tendencies, and so we contrive a situation where somebody is caught and proven to be doing something, so we have data on them, and we go to them and we say, look, we need you to vote this way on this particular bill, and if you don't, look, there's a little brown envelope here, look what's inside. Well. I never come across it directly in my investigations because I was never allowed. They stopped me. They nipped it in its bud. But subsequently, I have hearing more and more and more about, you know, blackmail. Mm. Black, the blackmail that has gone on. And one of the things I have to say on, on that front is that certain names have cropped up consistently. Mm. And I've become very connected um, within the police whistleblower, but also in the parliamentary field. And I'm hearing stories from there. The same politicians are repeatedly cropping up, and on, on the outset of Sorry, these, cropping up as offenders or just being as, as offenders, okay. as offenders, as people that like yeah. young children. Um, now, what happens then is that the the ones I heard about were married men, but what was said to me about one one I'll stick to one in particular who had a very high position, right, was married and had a, an outside view of good, honest family life. But there was a massive open secret um, amongst those he worked with and his peers that he was a closet homosexual mm -hmm. who liked young boys mm -hmm. and also liked dressing up as a woman. Right now, I'm going to say that when in the police you start dealing with very, very sensitive information, you are vetted. Mm -hmm. And they call it DV vetting. It's very intrusive Developed vetting. Yeah. yeah. And now I've been through it and I had to go on all about my lifestyle, who I know, declarable associations, I couldn't hang around with criminals. Mm. One of the, the main Achilles heel of people, the main reason they fail betting is their sexual activities. Mm. And I was told that if I was involved in swinging or, or wife swapping, mm. there's a good chance I wouldn't get the job. If I didn't tell them they found out, then I could be disciplined for it. Had to be honest. And one of the things they also said to me, and it was just a sergeant said this to me, that in this is quite un unbelievable, but in the times of political correctness, if you're a homosexual, lesbian or gay, you've got more of a propensity to have more sexual partners mm -hmm. and therefore be more prone to bribery and manipulation. coercion, manipulation, yes. everything else. And it will go against you. Mm -hmm. And it is allowed. I said, how do they allow it? It's just is what they do. Mm -hmm. Now, when this politician I'm referring to was given these high positions in land, when it was an open secret that this man had a liking for unnatural sex with young boys, perverted and illegal sex with young boys, how the hell was he allowed to get that? You know, and these are people that are decision makers. Mm -hmm. So, and we see it, um, references to it, allegorical references to it in so many films and dramas, it's untrue, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but to state it outright, then you get the, the wrath of the media on you, 
and also then you get um, the contempt laws coming in and one of the very brave whistleblowers is a man called Mike Veal who pursued, he was a chief constable wheelchair, pursued the uh, the case of um, not just child rape but murder and satanic ritual abuse against Ted Heath, Edward Heath and he he came under such monumental attack. You hear about this in the press but as soon as there are allegations made people are as you pointed out earlier, um, accused of being um, fantasists or conspiracy theorists. Of course but, but in your experience, is there um, significant ritual satanic child abuse somewhere like London? It goes on everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly organised and it's prevalent. So, so what, what happens? I mean, um, most people these days, um, you know, are quite kind of um, uh, rationalist. Um, whereas Satanism is uh, something most people would think um, couldn't really become. Very oh, they, they, they think it's for the confines of a hammer horror. Yeah. You know. Um, but again, it, it's a very covert and illegal religion. I mean, it's not illegal to, to worship Satan. You can do what you want. But when the rituals involve uh, sex with children, then of course you are going into illegal grounds. And th there was a fantastic book written by a lady called Audrey Harper, who was a street prostitute in London just outside of the times I was working there, but part of her um, briefing for her uh, co coven, whatever it was, was to go and take children from the care homes and take them to sex parties with coven members. Oh. So these children might not have actually witnessed rituals, yes. but they would have then been used to feed people's sexual, you know, likings. Do you think that was, was the known cooperation of people in care homes, or did they... Uh, than they were going to some social functions. The, the, the care system is, is a broader argument. Um, the care system doesn't care for the children. Mm. It, it is a machine that makes a vast amount of money. It makes more money the worse the children do. They do, yeah. yeah. If the kids got problems, they make a lot of money. Um, the kids go into care and, you know, if a kid then wants to abscond and go missing, we hear these figures of thousands of children going missing, um, they do return, but they go missing. No one stops them. The care home staff do record what's happening. And I'm going to give you an example. I went to the London Borough of Haringey as a detective on the child abuse investigation team there. Um, I was asked uh, to, as well as being an investigator on child abuse matters, if I would take on like a, a, an ancillary role as a liaison for children's homes. Now, Haringey had the most amount of children's homes of anywhere in the UK, 26. And I said to this sergeant, um, who dealt with it before? And he said, oh, there was a girl. She went on maternity leave. Um, she dealt with it for two years. And I said, was there ever any problems with child prostitution? And I was given a categorical no. What are you on about? Mm. Almost in the ignorance of the fact that it went on. Well, it's just that I've come from Vice, and the kids I dealt with had come from Cairns. No, 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 no problem. You'll go to a meeting, it's a bit of a day out, treat it as that, mm. easy, easy money. Um, so I said, so no problems with your job? No, none whatsoever. I picked up the phone, John, and I rang up social services, so please fax me the care homes and their contact numbers. That came through within minutes. I literally picked up the first number of the care home, said, how many children you got? Explained who I was, what I was doing, and no one was in any trouble. I went five. And it was a care home staff, not the owner said uh do you lose any of them at the weekend he went yeah about three of them what happens well they go usually someone picks them up on a thursday come back on monday hand on heart what happens to them oh they've been used as prostitutes mm -hmm. we've got the address uh, of where they're going there's the car we've got the registration of the car they had it all there mm -hmm. yet for two years this copy looked at them and nothing now three kids within and a do minute. you think he was genuinely naive or he was deliberately well, well, let me just expand on that. That by the end of three days, I'd found 50 children, 50 kids. Um, they can only do what they can do. Now, the police's job, the missing persons unit, is to record that, go and find them children if they can, and when they do turn up, debrief them what's been happening to you. It never went on. Mm. And the kids, where they were going, the vice unit should have gone and looked for them and took them. They never did. And then when they did find them, if they were, you know, um, being exploited, again, it was it was a duty of the child abuse unit also to get involved. 
So three units were paid to get involved and to take governance of these children. Not one of them did. I, I mean, that that is totally shocking and it sounds really far-fetched. I mean, there, there are you know, good people who decide to become policemen or police officers because they you know, care about communities, they care about law and order, they want to protect people. They are there with an opportunity to protect some of the most vulnerable people. Yeah, of course. And they do nothing. Why do you think that is? Oh, um, if if I'm asked my opinion, it's it's layered, lower down. Um, never underestimate snobbery and stupidity and laziness. Okay, uh, kids have slipped through the net because police don't want to go in the house because it smells. I've known of one little girl. They didn't want me to take her into protective custody because I put her in the car and she had scabies. And she was working on the streets as a, as a prostitute. Oh. So so you get that. Now, is that corruption? No. That's just bad practice and, and, and just snobbery, really. Yeah. So low down, no. But if these kids, like some of them are, are taken to big houses for sex parties mm -hmm. and they hold a lot of information, then there's more of a nefarious reason. When you say they hold a lot of information, who holds a lot of information? The children. The children. Mm -hmm. The children do. And some of them would say about mm. places you know some would say that they were they were traded for two thousand pounds and then the next day they could be taken to a crack house and traded for 20 when you say crack. traded who gets the money then the pimp okay and so how does the does the pimp have a relationship with the care home is there uh a no no there? no i never so, saw that no, i never okay. saw that the care home staff they're not allowed to restrain um the care home owners just make money and all they do, they're duty bound to fill out a form and inform the police, which is they do, for, you know, and there were care home staff that said, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, a lot of these children, if they've come from traumatic and abusive backgrounds, they're a nightmare. Yeah. And I mean that in all the most possible way. I know, I know. They're horrible. Yeah. They'll tell you to F off, spit yeah. at you, shout at yeah. you, whatever. No one's them near. They don't no, want them in, in your car, let alone in the house. Often, yeah. A lot of them were on heroin, crack mm. cocaine, uh, normal cocaine and everything else, cannabis. So they're going to be off their heads and all sorts. Um, it is, in my opinion, it's organised criminality mm -hmm. uh, and it's connected criminality. There were organised criminals involved. So how, how does the pimp manage to get hold of... Uh... Through grooming. Okay, so I mean, typically what approach will... Well, well uh, grooming... Um, preys on people's weaknesses. Now, children have got a need to be loved. You know, they're like a puppet, they mm. just want to be loved. Yeah, I have three of mine. Yeah, so, so there's a void in their life when they haven't been loved. And especially if they're in care, it's a lonely place for a kid, there's no one tucking them in at yeah. night. Um, so all of a sudden, that's filled by what we would call the Romeo. Mm -hmm. So the, the groomer would, if it's uh, a girl and, and it'll be a boy, a good looking lad will come on board and treat them well, look after them. One of the cases, the biggest case that it was a woman doing it. When you say come on, on board, do you mean come and work for the care home? No, 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 would approach the children, um, meet up with them. These kids are introduced to pimps by other children as well. Okay. You know, and they're encouraged to get more yeah. kids on board. I mean, that first contact, so you've got the children in the so, care So, home. What the, I'll give you an example, one of them, it was a woman that was doing it. She sort of took on the, the matriarchal role and we'd get the young girls and do their hair, do their makeup, tell them they look beautiful. And how did they establish that first contact? Well, what happens is that you're gonna get children that are the children of drug addicts. Okay. So they'll go and buy their drugs right. um, off a dealer and they'll know there's children. Right. They've got the children, so if there's a kid there, then the okay, dealer so the can get the parents of the children in the care the, home? The parents unwittingly can sometimes introduce the kids to, to a, a pimp, right. but kids' homes, are like um, they're like a honeypot of bees. You see, the 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 well versed groomer, stroke pimp, will know that say that one of these houses is a residential um, in a London care home. There's going to be five kids in there. And they'll just wait about, mm. and then when the kid goes, they'll just just talk to him, talk mm. to the girl. You know how beautiful you are, and and then all of a sudden they become their boyfriend, yeah. and there'll be a huge age difference, yeah. and. And say, look, you know, I love you and all that. And of course, then you've got a young teenage hormonal girl mm. in need of love, in need of it. And then they'll then start introducing them to cannabis, 
pornographic films. So where does that then happen? So how do they now get them well, well, into they'll, a well, well, they'll take them out. They'll take okay. them out. Um, now, there is a law, and I brought this up at a meeting, and I said w we can easily address this because mm. the Children's Act has a law, and it's if you take a child out of a care home at an unreasonable hour or out of a care placement, it's illegal, and it has the power to stop and search as well. So you can go into a home and kick the door in to retrieve that kid. Mm. It's a simple bit of legislation. Yes. And uh, I brought it up at a meeting once and uh, I was shut down for doing so. And what was the rationale against The rationale, that? and this was by someone in one of the kids' charities, brought this up, said I was treading in toes. Whose toes? Said there was already a unit looking at, the police unit looking at this and uh, I'm treading on toes and I shouldn't be and I will be reported to a superintendent for doing so. But but hang on, there's there's a law and the police have the obligation to enforce that law. How is that treading on toes? The, the, there was no toes to be trodden on. Because no. there was one appointed police officer for all of London. I went and met with her and I said to her, how many kids have you met? Do you go to these meetings? She said, I've gone to a couple of meetings, I've never met one kid. Really? And so it was a lie and it was a prominent children's charity one of the one of the two top charities in this country uh, one of the heads of it for safeguarding she shut me down so do you do you think I mean obviously not all of the causes for inaction on the part of the police are necessarily the same you can have relatively low level people who yeah. basically don't want to go into a smelly yeah, house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you can have people who just don't care. Don't, you know, yeah. people who have been abused by some of these youngsters and so they've become quite hard towards. And these kids have stopped. They're making money. Yeah. They've got their, their pimp boyfriend mm -hmm. who then gets them to have sex with other people. Mm -hmm. And this is how it starts. They, they're, they're going to be loyal. Mm -hmm. So they, on the whole, don't um, give up their pimp. Okay, don't betray mm -hmm. their pimp. Yeah. Um, so no one knows about it. No victim, no crime, as they mm. say. Because he doesn't have a name tag, you know, with a job description. I'm a pimp. I'm a pimp. I'm yeah. basically your boyfriend, but we do things a bit differently. I like to show you around a bit. And so she's can. she's not kind of officially a prostitute. And if you said to her, that "You're a prostitute," you'd say, "No, I'm not. We just, you know, my boyfriend just shows me around a bit." And then they get them on drugs, mm -hmm. and and that is a big lever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what happens is when they get to a certain age, if they're very young, the brothels won't take them. If a girl's about 14, they can pass off as 18, and they'll take them to the brothel and work them out the brothel. So, so a pimp might get a handful of girls from a care home, and then does he get more money because there's more regular work, because she's basically seeing more oh, there'll clients? Be, there'll be income, yeah, the more clients, the more money. Okay, so, because, I mean, so, a pimp is essentially an agent for a, a brothel. Well, not necessarily, the brothels tend to be just a place of work. Okay. Um, the, Do they rent a room there? Yeah, yeah. The, well, the, the, there'll be rooms there. The girls will sit in, in, in a holding area and a client will pick the ones they want. And then they'll pay the girl, but the girl must then pay the house as well. Right. So the house takes a cut, the girl will get some money, and then that money is taken off her for the pimp. Okay, so as far as the pimp is concerned, um, he sees these girls as a source of income. That's what they are. So to begin with, um, he just um, poses as the boyfriend, gets them interested, um, hence the pornographic videos to kind of um, get them into that whole kind of scene. Yeah, well, they get them used to sex, you know. But from, from, from what age, typically? Well, 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 I mean, typically young teens. I mean, I dealt with them from nine upwards. Wow. But, uh, but if they've also come from um, sexually abusive backgrounds, yeah. then, 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 you know, they're in on it. I yeah. mean, we... I'm not saying that um, social workers wouldn't have been on it because they probably were social workers in it and there were police officers in mm -hmm. on it. And on one of the, the um, inquiries, there was a judge that had some involvement with the whole thing as well. So, um, but it's getting to it. You can only deal with what, what you know and what you can prove. Mm -hmm. But it is a big business that has gone on. Now, one of the things that has really sort of got me, and I'm, I'm putting this out, is that we are hearing about grooming gangs and child prostitution gangs, mainly in the north of England, mm. in, in the, the, the Pakistani communities of Bradford, Leeds, Rochdale, Rotherham. Rotherham, you know, and then you've got Aylesbury, Luton and Oxford. Well, I, nothing I dealt with really had any sort of um, religious element to mm. it. There was one case where Bengali lads were pimping out, mm. non-Bengali girls, but it was quite a small, unorganised outfit. Um, 
it there was no real political element to this this was just purely organized crime we have not heard of one case in london hmm. now bear in mind london is the biggest urban conurbation in the western western world you know mm -hmm. um and also it's when you look at the i think back in 2000 then the national crime squad's statistics were that 75 percent of all organized crime occurs in and around london yeah i mean statistically it's going to be impossible that this is not going on uh, yeah exactly yeah. and and when when you looked at it, it was me and a girl that were the the main dedicated officers for it and then they shut us down and it's and then I got threatened. So there is a reluctance to and and when we're going back you're saying about um denigrating people, what we've seen when people have come up and they've made allegations that they were used as a prostitute and the clients were politicians and people of high social mm -hmm. esteem, they've been denigrated as being liars, drug addicts and now, you're not going to find many victims of abuse that, that go on to, to have normal, fully functioning lives. No. You know, alcohol is a, mm. is a big element. Um, heroin is an analgesic, a painkiller, mm. and that you, tends to be the drug of choice. Yeah. And once you're on heroin, you've got to fund it. Mm. And that gets funded by shoplifting. Now, in 2003, the government brought in the Bad Character Act, which meant that someone's uh, previous convictions as long as they were relevant, could be brought up in a trial, whether it's uh, the accused or, or the victim. Now, if you've got someone who's got a history of criminality because they've been abused and drug addiction and shoplifting, they're then going to be seen as a dishonest character in the yeah. eyes of the law. Now, when they make these statements, years later, because they feel safe and ready to do so, they're instantly trashed. Mm, I you can know? see that, yeah. And this is what is happening. Yeah. Now, uh, a police officer came to me and he said to me, I want to tell you something. He said, when I was working at Rochester Road Police Station um, in the, I think it was in the late, late 80s, they were brought in, the officers, the patrol officers, and they were told by the superintendent, no one is to stop any person or car coming in or out of Dolphin Square. Now, is that so? Dolphin Square is Pimlico, Pimlico and Dolphin Square was parliamentary residential building oh, right. and that's cropped up with um, victims and survivors of abuse have said we were taken to parties there were politicians then that was in oh. Dolphin Square and so they're saying that they're being rubbish by the law that they're, they're now getting whistleblown cops come in and saying look this is yeah. what's gone on there has yes. been a silencing now my campaign is to protect whis police whistleblowers and therefore gain justice for victims and survivors of abuse. Now, a victim of abuse will never get justice if the police are silenced. The mm -hmm. police hold the information, right? The police are outside of employment law. They can do what they want with us, and they do. Mm -hmm. And what they try and do is imprison us. Really? And two of the offenses they tend to go for is um, breaching data protection, because it's a massive variable, what I might deem as disclosable, another officer might not and if I've disclosed something I shouldn't have done then I'll say you've breached it. Yeah. It's a criminal offence which is a whistleblower from Manchester, Maggie Oliver and one of my whistleblowers what they did with him they uh, and I've heard this on a few occasions now they do them for mortgage fraud and he said to me they know that police officers hyper inflate their earnings to mm -hmm. get a mortgage so they don't live in a crappy area. Yeah. And so they did that. He was a whistleblower on child prostitution in Hampshire, and they took him to Crown Court for mortgage fraud. The case didn't go anywhere, but he said, This is one of the things you must look at. They'll yeah. try and get you for mortgage fraud. Uh, so it, it, it is an algorithm of bullying, which I've yeah. come up with, and it is sinister and it is orchestrated at the very top. Now, I'd really like to understand that because I was saying earlier, I can understand how some of the more junior people within the police may just not want to get involved because um, they don't care about these people, they may have been abused by them, they deal with criminals all the time and they associate... And they haven't got time either. No, no. They're time consuming and... But where you have, and I can, I can almost, I can almost understand um, where you have that level where maybe these people live in a care home, one of these young girls has a boyfriend who's passing her around 
Um, I, I can kind of almost understand how they could turn a blind eye to that. But where it gets to the level where it is organized and you have politicians yep. coming in, this I can't really understand no. because there must be some people who are very senior who, who know these politicians um, with respect to their role in security, for example. There must only put politicians... Um, have security details, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't really understand then how senior police, they're, they're not dealing with people on the street in houses that smell with uh, syringes on, you know, lying around and that no, kind no, of thing. No. This I don't really understand. So why do you think that once, once police understand what is going on with politicians, I mean, who likes politicians anyway? I mean, why don't the police just go after the politicians? Well, well, well one uh, protection officer told me, um, and he was in the the protection officer for uh, the politician I've inferred to earlier, yes. um, said that we had to stop him many times because he was trawling public toilets around Victoria Station trying to pick up young boys. So these protection officers know. They know. Yeah. And what they have in policing the, the carrot and the stick here, I mean, it's the pension. Mm. You know, the stick is discipline, you do as you're told, we're a discipline yeah. service, very military in its mm. bearing on that. And the other one is pension. Pension, pension, pension. So they buy their silence. Mm. Now, you couldn't buy my silence because money means nothing to me. So, I mean, let, let's imagine you were uh, a CPA for an MP, okay, and you saw what he was doing, yeah. okay. And you, let's say, you had evidence of what he was doing somehow. If you've got the evidence of what he's doing, how can he damage you? I mean, if you expose him for what he's yeah, doing. Yeah, but what will happen is he can't damage you, but your senior officers can. But, okay, so let's investigate that. So you go to your senior officer and you say, look, I'm working for this guy here. He's done this and this, it's outrageous. What did we all join the force to do? It's to protect these people. We've got an opportunity to do some real good here. Let's go after this guy. And your senior officer says to you, watch. But but that that is a situation I was in. Yes. Now, what was said to me, you will lose your home, your children and your job. So why didn't you say to him, no, come, you work with me. Let's go after this guy. Let's nail him. But, well, I turned around and I said, yeah. this is perverse. Yes. What, what have I done wrong? And he just said, you have no idea who or what you're dealing was with. Was he scared? Was your senior officer scared? I, I, I'm going to say this now. Um, I think the man now uh, is a dirty man and a coward for what he's done. But moments before that meeting, I had utmost respect for him. Yeah. I like the guy. Yeah. I've got no reason to rubbish him. or Because yeah. yeah. he was a likeable man. Yeah. I would say, it, it's. I was asked this in an interview over it, what your reasons. And I had to really say... A corruptible reason because morally there's no way any who the, on God's earth would allow that to go on that criminality to go on really I mean I, I said to Cressida Dick the current commissioner I sat before and I said to her Cressida I could go to a children's home I can get a young girl I can groom that girl I can have sex with that girl I can then get my friend to have sex with that girl I can get that girl then to get her friends involved and we can get other people to have sex with them children and make a lot of money. You have not appointed one dedicated officer to deal with that. Mm. But if I was to lean over my fence and call my neighbour, and I said a derogatory term, right? Yeah. Derogatory racial term, right? Yeah. And it was an example. Yeah. And there was nine people around the desk. She didn't have a meeting with me. She had nine people mm. sat around the What'd desk. She say? Someone had a sharp intake of breath. Mm. And I said, I've just mentioned about grooming and having sex with young children <laughs> no one even blinked I said a derogatory word. term yeah and I said this yeah. is perverse uh, yeah. and I said and if I did that you would have me in court mm. and have an asbo on me yeah. you know I would lose my job the council will probably kick me out and but I've got council house but and, and, and I said how is that right in a moral and democratic society mm. try and justify that and they, well, they said nothing mm absolutely nothing mm. and the next thing I'm being investigated for more crimes mm. which I never committed and whereas I made allegations yeah. and the investigation was scant mm. to say the very least I never received any disclosure or any debrief at all which I should have done under the yeah. code of practice yet they decided to go through six seven years of my old emails trawl through them 
as a victim and a witness. Looking for some way to threaten you. You know, I, I mean, it, it's, nef it, it's just wrong. And mm. it is wrong. And, and that was a mindset that was out to get mm. me to shut me up, and it was. But let's, let's have a look at that. So your senior officer, um, what is he scared of? And why doesn't he join forces with you and say, come on, let's go after these bags? Well, exactly, I can't answer that. Mm. I can't answer that. And maybe that's how it's always been. Mm. How it always has been. Maybe he's involved. I mean, we, we can't also um, overlook the fact that there have been allegations that organised criminals, gangsters, have been involved. Mm. And that has cropped up with quite a few of the whistleblowers and that have had unhealthy relationships with senior officers. Yeah. So we've got corruptible relationships, you know, and there's huge money incentives to be mm. earned from that. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, there could just be kind of small vulnerabilities on the part of people who haven't been perfect within the police, who if these things are investigated, they know that they'll be found for something. It may not be really major, but it's enough to frighten them to not want an investigation. So, I mean, with all of this going on, what is the solution? Well, the solution is that the police, it's got to be an offence to know about these crimes and say nothing. Mm -hmm. It has to be. They have to have a, a criminal duty. Do you know what I mean? A yes, legal yeah. duty. Not a moral one, a legal one. Everyone's got a moral duty to stand in and help someone. Mm -hmm. But that's where, and they choose not to on most of And this, this law, would it apply mostly towards the police? I, w I would start with the police uh, mm -hmm. only because we are outside of the employment laws. Mm -hmm. Right, and when the police legitimately come forward, because mm -hmm. some might use it as an insurance policy for yeah. wrongdoing, but mm -hmm. they legitimately come forward, that they are protected from any investigation. Mm -hmm. They are given total protection, um, and it is encouraged, you know, from the very top. And and I think that these chief constables have to now be held vicariously liable mm -hmm. for these failings, and they should not be able to have their legal expenses paid for by the uh, general public, mm. whereas I am suing them, I have to pay my legal expenses, mm. they defend themselves with public money, mm. you know, and this is where it's wrong. And if we look at how society has been denigrated due to child abuse, mm. um, I've got, I had a conversation, a meeting with head of the forensic psychiatry for the NHS, and he turned around and said, 90% of all adult referrals have come from child traumatic backgrounds. Our criminal justice system is absolutely crumbling because of, you know, overfilled with inmates. You take 75% of them have come from child traumatic backgrounds, mm -hmm. abuse backgrounds. Um, drug addicts, even a higher percentage have come from drug yes. abuse backgrounds. Yes. Uh, and this all has to be paid for. Yes. All their legal fees yeah. have to be paid for their accommodation, these children's home. It's, it, it's financially viable to sort mm -hmm. this out, nip it in the bud. I, I saw a calculation that um, estimated that Britain lost something like £48 billion pounds in revenues because of family breakdown. Mm. Now, obviously, this could be this yeah. could be contested, but we're talking of a figure of that kind of order. Why are we doing this to our children? And that is a big question. A Christian society, what the hell are we doing to our children? And why are these officers covering this up? They should be in court, these officers. And we've seen it, time. we've just seen it in Telford, and they had the chief council there saying we've learnt lessons and I thought no this isn't good enough no not no, good enough no. so um, this this bill which you would want to see proposed in parliament yeah. and voted through um, would make it an offence for um, a police officer for example to know that um, these crimes are being committed yeah and to not pass that information up the yep. chain of command. Okay, so yep. in the scenario which you gave me where you went to your senior officer and yep. you told him, now he knew about it, he would be obliged to yep. escalate it yep. up the chain of command yep. until action was and, taken. And, and I should have then been dealt with as a an victim and an informant of this, hmm. dealt with properly. Um, and the proper information elicited from me and praised mm -hmm. for it, yeah. really. I mean, you, you've given much more thought to, to this than I have just hearing it for the yeah, first time. Yeah. To me, this sounds like something that ought obviously to be voted through Parliament. What do you think would be the resistance to this, the opposition to well, it? Well, I, I, if we look at it on the community as a whole, yeah. right, I now work with victims and survivors of abuse, mm -hmm. and I'm an ex-police detective. Yeah. 
near enough everyone I work with has got a criminal history um, I've given talks to alcohol and rehab centres that are full of serious and violent criminals I have been met with nothing but compassion and praise mm -hmm. I have just walked from London to Manchester along the canals with my dog to raise money for this I was just treated again with compassion and praise throughout that mm -hmm. entirety of the walk yes. unanimously I am loved for what mm -hmm. I am doing the only people who don't want this are the chief constables. I have got officers coming to me and said, we know about this, brave man, you're a good man, I wish I was as strong as you. I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. I see them as a bit weak and not made of the metal that I now know I'm made of. Yeah. At the time I didn't, but these chief constables, they're the ones that are fearful. Mm -hmm. They are fearful. And again, they must be vicariously liable if they know about this and have not properly investigated it. So have you taken this proposal to any members of parliament? This has gone to the former policing and, and um, crime commissioner Mike Penning, Sir Mike Penning. Mm -hmm. He, to my knowledge, has taken it to Home Secretary. Okay. There's also another MP called Andrew Bridgen and Andrew Mitchell mm -hmm. that are doing likewise. And I know that there is uh, a group called Whistleblowers UK that have okay. got a similar thing in motion for whistleblowers in general, but mine is specifically policing. So um, why does a Member of Parliament not just sponsor a private member's bill in Parliament to be voted on? Again, I just can't account for them and I don't know why I've not been brought before Parliament. And okay, well this this to me... I have, yeah. I have just um, put in a proposal mm. that myself and I've named five other whistleblowers mm. uh, that we go before the Home yeah. Secretary on this. Because to, to me, um, whatever MP took this up as his or her bill would become a national hero. They would do. The public would love them. In oh, of course the, they would. The yeah. prison population would love them. Yes. Uh, the people that have come from the care system, the mental yes. health institutions, probably near enough every single work in a lower class area would love them for it. If, if a member of parliament did nothing else in their entire life yeah. other than get this bill through, their life would have been worth living. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. So what, what are you going to do to try to get um, this bill into Parliament? I've, I've got another um, charity campaign going in which I'm going to be cycling uh, from London to Penzance and then I'm swimming around the entire Silly Isles um, and again I will be campaigning. I've now got a group with me that are campaigning. They're going to rallies and they're handing out leaflets campaigning. Um, my MP I'm waiting for him to get back to me, Mike Penning, you know, so he's my constituent MP as well as being uh, the former policing minister, mm -hmm. so I am in constant communication with him, um, and we're just trying to push it up higher mm -hmm. and higher, and each whistleblower is doing likewise with their MP. How long ago did you approach Penning? 2015. Okay, so have you just asked him straight, you know, with all due respect, where's the parliamentary bill? No, okay. Because I'm, I've not been educated as to the parliamentary process. So. Okay. Well, I mean, that's that. That to me is quite shocking. That he, I mean, I'm sure he's a good bloke. Yeah. He, he's got his reasons. But to, for for to have been presented with this three years ago, and for this not to have. What well, one of the reasons is I have civil litigation against the police, and there has been concerns that that would cause some sort of perversion with the justice process if that is put through um, that is a reason that has been given mm. and what the validity of that is I'm no, not too I sure don't, I don't really see that as a as a connection I mean because I think there might be a privileged you know um, mm. position there with that so yeah um, but I mean it's just it's just the simple wording of the bill to be based on in Parliament I, I, I scratch my head all the time as to why no one is taking it seriously mm why the national media haven't mm. really made this a national campaign. Mm. I just don't know why. Because I, I think this is something that we need to we need to push for. Yeah. And um, for, for me, it's not a party political issue. No, 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 I, it's a moral would, issue. Yeah, I, I would be willing to work with any political party yeah. who is willing to stand side by side with you to, to advance this. Well, it needs yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. By hook or by crook, it needs doing. I mean, thank thank you so much for talking to me. I'm so pleased yeah. that um, you were able to answer the question when I asked you what is the solution. You believe that if this became law, um, we would be able to do something in this country very significant.
towards addressing this massive problem. Oh, it's a massive ruining, problem. Ruining people's lives and is impacting on our economy. Um, you think that this measure would make a significant difference? I, I genuinely believe that the majority of social ills are attributed to child abuse, mm -hmm. and I do. Mm -hmm. And I think it will make a monumental difference. Drop, thank you. No, very, it's a very pleasure. Much indeed. No, very pleasure. Too difficult to, to listen to some of that, yeah. but I'm so grateful. Yeah. And and if I can, I have got a uh, GoFundMe page. GoFundMe, I think John Wedger, J O N Wedger. And if people can get behind my campaign. So, so how would we find that? Would we just Google GoFundMe? GoFundMe, and, and I Wedger. think if you search on their internal search, John Wedger, J O N W E D G E R, it comes up with my own. I need to get the funding. It, the um, Apart from logistical costs, it's going to children's charities and rehab centres for victims of abuse. Excellent. So. Uh, well, thank you. And thank you so much for no. all that you're doing. God bless you. Yeah, thank you.